Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to start the session after the inaugural session. And uh, for that, I'd like to request uh, Mr. Amit Sharma, Chief Data Scientist, ADP, to please come onto the stage and make his presentation. He'll be, the topic of his presentation is Applications and Challenges of Machine Learning in HR. Um, I'll get started while the computer boots up. My name is Amit Sharma, and I lead the uh, AI ML division for ADP, which is one of the leading HR solutions provider uh, worldwide. So ADP stands for Automatic Data Processing. And you must have heard about how important data as oil, money is. So data is our middle name. And we are sitting on like 65 years of data. And the good thing about uh, being in the business of data science, when you have a lot of data to work with, is that really makes it easy. You cannot do a lot of, obviously, data science without data. And if it is not reliable enough, even more so. So uh, we pay people. We know exactly to the penny as to how much people make. And that makes it very easy for us to do a lot of science along with it. So today I'm going to talk about a few applications in HR analytics. And I'm also going to uh, kind of touch upon, in 20 minutes, it's very difficult to cover the whole nine yards. But I'm going to touch upon what are the various challenges we face in the process of building products using data science, and uh, what are the various uh, uh, how do we mitigate those challenges? So yeah, let's use this 20 minutes for a quick overview of what goes on in, in data science in ADP. So give me a moment. I wasn't prepared for using my own laptop, so it will take me a tiny moment to get it up. OK, and for some reason, the resolution plays tricks on us. So uh, without much ado, let's get started. I already introduced myself. My background is in BTEC, uh, you know, from RIC Raukela. I grew up in Raukela, the steel city, uh, Orissa. Uh, did my schooling and engineering from there, ele applied electronics and instrumentation. So I have a very soft corner for uh, this steel city. And coming to ADP, like I said, we are in the human capital management. Now human, OK. As soon as it shows up, yeah, lucky. The, is something wrong? It's loose? I'm sorry about that, guys. But it should be up and running in no time. So uh, how many of you are actually practicing data science? In the meanwhile, let me get a show of hands. Or how many of you are into the analytics space doing something with data science? Quite a few hands. That's very encouraging. That will help me pitch the problems that we face at a level which is uh, probably going to resonate with you. So uh, the whole uh, nine yards of human capital management, that's what ADP does. Uh, I will not spend too much time on it. What I want to uh, touch upon next is the evolution of uh, AI maturity any company goes through, right? So many of you in the field of data analytics and data science would be actually looking at uh, descriptive to start with. Some reports are being run, some uh, BI is being done, you are going through the data warehouse, scavenging information in terms of how did I do my, on my sales quarter on quarter in this location make some important decisions, but that is all hindsight. You are actually making decisions based on going through what has happened and relying on some experts who can mine data and get you those insights. So uh, that is descriptive analytics. Quickly comes uh, following that is diagnostics, what went wrong? And this is again a layer above descriptive because you are trying to correlate things. You are trying to see in this particular region, my sales did not go as well. 
Maybe it's to do with the fact that this marketing channel doesn't work that well in that region. So uh, that is diagnostic. And both of these are mostly analytics, BI reports, like I have mentioned them, call them out in the left-hand side. The next comes predictive analytics. Now you're talking about what can possibly happen with a degree of confidence. No prediction happens without a certain degree of confidence. Because if we are 100% confident, we are God, right? So we are not that. We are still uh, going to make a prediction based on certain parameters, based on the patterns we have found in the data. And this is where machine learning comes in and subsequently the prescriptive analytics. And the reason I bring up this slide is not just to make the theory obvious, but also the fact that we are actually dwelling on the prescriptive side. We have made a few predictive solutions, and it's not very easy to get into the prescriptive space, by the way, as you will see in a moment. HR analytics, I mean, what is HR analytics? Uh, there are so many aspects to it. Think about what does a manager's nightmare look like? What does managers sleep, uh, might lose their sleep on? Can you think of any problem a manager might always be worried about? Oh, who am I going to lose next? More so in India. The <laughs> industry churn in this, in the, you know, in the talent is so high, a manager would give you anything to let him or her know as to who are the people who are going to leave the organization with a certain degree of accuracy, right? And that's, that's one area which I'm going to focus on today. So without much ado, let me just uh, touch upon the data science process. This will apply to all of us, regardless of uh, which field we are in. We are in pharma, banking, retail, or uh, any such field, BFSI. The fact is, everything starts with asking a question. Hey, is this possible that people are leaving because maybe they're not getting paid enough, or maybe they're not getting promoted? This is called, in, uh, in technical terms, the hypothesis. And then you start digging into data to either accept it or reject it. The good thing is data scientists are very nice people. They want to reject the hypothesis because that's when they really realize the value of data. What, so just to give an example, I will assume, I will start with a null hypothesis like we call it, saying that there's no correlation between what we pay people and whether they stay with us or not. But in my heart, I know I want to reject that null hypothesis. And that's where this uh, whole cycle of data science begins. But asking the right question is most important. So many a times we emphasize too much on the technical part of the problem as technologists or data scientists that I'm going to use a deep learning CNN, RNN, that we forget what is the business problem we are trying to solve, right? So spend enough time to know what you are doing is really going to help business grow, make some money or not. Following that, you have to source the data. This is something which engineers come in, right? You have to source data from local, internal, external sources. You then explore the data. Exploration, by the way, a lot of identification of correlations and insighting can happen at this stage itself without a lot of machine learning yet. So if you have the right business guys with you, analysts with you, a lot of ideation can happen at this stage, at the exploration phase itself. And obviously, after the exploration, which was more about descriptive and diagnostic analytics, we are looking at modeling. And modeling is about being able to either classify or predict or identify in an image, for example. And I have also called out the uh, part about sharing the results. I cannot overstate the need for telling a story right. You may be the greatest data scientist of the world, but I have learned the tough way that unless we simplify for the end user to consume, there's no way they are going to use it and hence the whole thing fails. Ultimately, we are doing this to make money, to do some business or do some good. And if that doesn't get realized through a nice storytelling, it's all uh, in vain, right? So the problem I want to talk about today is the manager's nightmare. Which employee is going to leave me? In, in uh, HR terms, it's called voluntary turnover. In voluntary is when the company fires the guy. Then the company knows who's going to get fired, right? It is when the company doesn't know. The employee knows who's going to get fired, and uh, who's going to leave. And I can bet quite a few of us might be planning to leave our company, and managers have no clue. And same with our people, right? So the cost of turnover is extremely high. This is formulating the problem, saying that if I was able to predict who's going to leave the company, how will I benefit? I will save almost twice the annual compensation which is wasted in finding a refill. So we have to formulate the business problem, right? And organizations obviously want to cost, minimize the cost of attracting, hiring, retaining, and bringing them up to speed uh, for their best talent. So um, like I said, it will help retain the right employees. So let me just quickly move to how did we go about sourcing the data and the challenges here. Sourcing the data is not um, difficult for us for most part because we are the HR providers. We had people which job titles they are moving from, how long they have spent in a company. We are paying one in every six 
about uh, 35 million employee records we had. So that wasn't the biggest deal. The bigger deal was security and legal. And I can tell you, security and legal are the uh, data scientists' worst <laughs> enemies. Because, and not, not for wrong reasons, by the way. They are there for a good reason. They help you make sure that you are not intruding into anyone's privacy or anyone's uh, uh, data security beyond what is acceptable. And leaders ahead of me actually spoke about how important that is. In fact, uh, the government of East Bengal denied the hospital data for the same reason that it is not acceptable that patients' data without their consent is being made uh, commoditized, right? We are not allowed to use many such things like, you know, you're not allowed to use SSN, which is fine. We are not allowed to use marital status. Apparently, marital status has a role to play in people leaving a company. Many people, many women folks, if they get married in India particularly, will move to a different place. There's a higher likelihood. So those things, but we are not allowed to use. Fair enough, we have to work with what we have. We are not allowed to use age beyond the age of 40 because it can become an age discrimination factor. Now, some of these, when you are told you cannot use by the legal, you have to simply let go. Others, you have to see how you can handle it through a proxy. For example, you cannot use age beyond 40, but can you bargain with legal? And you're not bargaining uh, in a wrong way. You're saying that, hey, if I was to bucketize, bin it, and say 30 and beyond, would that be okay as a gender you know, age discrimination, not being an age discrimination? Because beyond 30, people do not know what age it is. So it's very unlikely that someone will be seen as a 50 plus guy and discriminated against. So things like those we have to think through. We figured out that neighborhood is a very important indicator of uh, whether a person will stay in the company or not. A person who's making a lot of money, I mean, sorry, who's living in a very rich neighborhood, turns out they are likely to leave the company because they're aspirationally more activated. I mean, they see all the money around them. They are more likely to leave the company compared to people who live in a poorer community. Again, these are signals, but we were not allowed to use neighborhood information, the zip code, for the reason that it turned out to be uh, a zip code is a proxy to uh, racial discrimination. There are certain neighborhoods where certain race kind of people stay. So again, like I was saying, it is better to be upfront about what problem you're solving using the data you're solving because once it's over and you get sued or your company gets sued, it's all over, right? So we don't want. So when you build products or think of data, think long term, think when you take it through UK, GDPR, which is a new, forget my data law, you have to consider all those aspects. The velocity and granularity are more technical, meaning if you are pl planning to predict quarter on quarter if employee is going to leave, do you have the data incoming at that rate or not? Because if your data is coming on a yearly basis, you cannot make a prediction on a quarterly basis. It's going to be stagnant for the whole year, right? So uh, these are some considerations. Like I said, you need to have a lot of data. Big data is never a problem. Today, technology enables us from a memory and CPU standpoint to deal with big data easily. If ever you should be worried about it is small data, lack of data. Because lack of data turns out to be lack of evidence. And which is where you cannot formulate a hypothesis or at least prove or disprove it. So uh, we, we had, uh, luckily, a lot of data. So all we had to do was what is called feature engineering. Uh, those who are in this field will know feature engineering is about identifying what are the various aspects which drive the outcome. Like in this case, what are the various data points which can possibly decide whether or not an employee is going to leave. These come from domain expertise. And I cannot overstate the need for a very strong domain expert in your team. Remember, a data scientist uh, uh, sometimes it's like a unicorn. The guy is like, knows everything, but you rarely do such things happen. You have a data science team. You have people coming together, domain experts, engineering experts, programmers, and of course the data scientist, the guy knows more statistics than a programmer and more programming than a statistician. But somehow he's able to really uh, get them all together in the data science team and be able to uh, work with them. So all these aspects, some of them were obvious, like everyone thought compensation was the biggest factor. Turns out it's not. But there are many other, like how long they have stayed in the company, when was the last time they got promoted, how many times they have changed the roles, what is the team size? We found a straight correlation between how big is the team and whether a company is, uh, sorry, whether an employee is going to leave the company or not. So like if a manager has 20 people, turns out he's less likely to leave the, uh, to lose people compared to if he has 100 people. Because I, I guess it's intuitive also. You have a personal connect when you are, uh, you know, when you have a team small enough. So, that we used actually, team size. Also, we brought in past turnover history. Turns out uh, turnover has a, by turnover I mean attrition, has an inertia. So you have to bring in what is called autocorrelation, whenever there's a lag factor. 
past in you know, the past uh, if a manager has lost a lot of people he or she is very likely to lose continue to lose people so all these aspects come in factor so again my my emphasis here is not to detail the features as much as think through all the domain aspects and bring in as many as possible obviously with legal uh, on your side and obviously these are the steps you follow then you explore the data i talked about data analysis flow distributions are they telling you a story or not you have to handle by the way the real world data is not kaggle like kaggle like is really nice and all beefed up and stuff but the re and uh, we are talking about gautam was talking about the india data that won't be any good either uh, you know the real data will be with too many holes too many outliers too many junk how do you handle them is going to be one of the biggest challenges and uh, i'm not going to spend I, if i had a lot of time i would have spent some on this one but let me just move on with this next comes the modeling of data so this is where we talk about building a predictive capability using machine learning algorithms and stuff so the only thing i have learned uh, from my experience in building these kind of models uh, is a the simpler the model the better do not get into a deep learning uh, decide that i want a deep learning model first and then decide what you want to solve that is like putting the cart before the horse that doesn't work so you've got to look at uh, there is a something called a occam's rule occam's rule says that if you have to choose between two models go for the one which explains it simply because the simpler model is easy to explain if you have those in data science will know there is a linear regression and or a logistic regression both are the uh, you know uh, brothers uh, of the same fraternity and there are some non linear models like uh, you know which go uh, ensemble like random forest and gradient boosting machines if the complex one is giving you a 2% more accuracy even then you may want to settle for a simpler one a 2% less accuracy for the reason that you can explain it a linear or logistic regression in terms of how many times the output is a function of the input gives you a very clear picture that is valuable that is extremely valuable because the moment you predict something the first question people are going to ask is why are you saying so why should i trust you on what basis are you saying and if you tell them mine is a non linear model which works on the deep deep interactions of a neural network they are not going to buy it uh, they might i mean depends on how good your relation is but in general people don't buy it and uh, obviously it has to be reliable means it has to be consistent it cannot for the same guy uh, say uh, one guy say that he is highly likely to leave and for another guy with a very similar set of features say that he is not likely to leave i mean that's not being reliable interpretable is what i just spoke about it should be explainable you know if i am not able to explain why the output is what it is i am losing some edge from a business standpoint there and actionability which means i should also be able to bring out factors which can be actioned on if i say people in your company are leaving uh, largely because they, their age is high it's not going to I mean, people can't change their age or marital status though i don't use it i can't get them married uh, just because they are leaving my company right actionable attributes are if they have not been promoted or if their team size is too high or maybe they need to be moved to a new manager those are the actionable attributes so again these are my experiences some of you might already be aware aware of that but uh, you know i just thought it was important from a technology standpoint uh, we should not discriminate whatever we are good at spss sas r python h2o just pick up something and move on one more thing which we need to really handle in data science models is validation so uh, i do not want to uh, you know uh, dwell too much on this but a uh, simple idea see machine learnings are supposed to look at past data and generalize identify patterns which explain the outcome generalizing generalizability is the key thing but if your machine learning algorithm on the contrary starts memorizing is when you start suffering from what is called overfitting overfitting works beautifully for the data you learned from but works extremely bad with new data so how do you prevent overfitting not all of us will be doing the model but if a data scientist in my teams comes to me and says hey i built a model with 95% accuracy even without looking at anything i can start doubting him rightfully so because such accuracy numbers are truly a signs of overfitting but technically what you can do is we we have this trained trust split right so we can keep some data exclusively for evaluation of the model and how does the model do on that evaluation data is going to really test tell me whether it's a overfitted model or not we do not want overfitting we do not want underfitting underfitting is bias basically where your model simply is not able to explain the outcome even for the training data 
So somewhere between them, there is an optimal solution. And remember, I mean, it's very easy. Like I said, you just take a split of the data to test. So whenever you get like a one petabyte of data, keep 0.3 petabyte aside, and then give 0.7 petabyte to your data scientist and say, go do whatever you want to, bring it on. When the model comes back, you test it with the 0.3 petabyte. Obviously, you cannot create future. So you simulate future by cutting the past into a known and unknown, unknown to the data scientist, and you evaluate the model in that. And that's where you know if the accuracy he or she got was 90% and you get like a 60%, somewhere there's a clear overfitting. And once you validated the model, the last thing, I have one minute left, okay. I have one minute left, so I'll just summarize. One more thing is basically you, you've got to convey how good is your model to your end users. They are not data scientists. They are not going to understand the measures of accuracy like sensitivity, specificity, recall, precision. I, I, they, they will not going to get it. So you have to, in a very simple meaning, because you are also bidding against competitors, right? So you have to make it extremely um, intuitive for them to understand why just saying 99% accuracy doesn't cut it in a classifier model, okay? So again, I'm rushing and I'm sorry for that. We can catch up offline. Amit Sharma, ADP, if you look up on LinkedIn, we can connect and talk more. But uh, just to show you, you have to keep your results simple. Here we are predicting people leaving the company and we are doing so in a very, you know, very, very simple way. Which employees, which managers, what jobs? And only if they want to look further into any information, we give them data about, okay, for this employee, these are the factors because of which they are leaving. And what are the factor values compared to the benchmark of the company, or com benchmark of the industry. Some other problems we have solved is how much merit increase to give people, but not an easy problem, by the way. It may seem like simply give away and they will be happy, it doesn't work out. Overtime prediction, because you can save a lot of money by predicting overtime. You've also, one last problem we solved very recently was matching jobs to profiles. So this is very interesting. You know, if you're hiring for a position, you will find yourself really struggling to go through 100, 200 resumes to find that one person or maybe a few people whom you want to shortlist. Candidate relevancy, we are using a word embedding, using Google Word to VEC to find the right candidate for, uh, uh, you know, interviews. So I'll, I'll summarize by finding, uh, you know, the traits of a successful data professional being intellectually curious. They have to be happy just by themselves sitting in a corner and doing that detective work. And they should have a great domain knowledge, and it can be a team, by the way. Great communication skills, statistical knowledge goes without saying, and programming is a must-have too. So with that, um, you know, I am kind of done with uh, my presentation, <laughs> and I'm sorry it had to be rushed, but uh, whatever I have said is summarized on this slide. By the way, I'll make these slides public. There's nothing I have to keep here, so I mean, uh, please do reach out to me, and I'll share the link with you, or uh, Gautam and Rajiv have it anyway. So with that, I'm open for questions. Or maybe not, depending on, do I have some time for questions? Yeah, guys, please feel free to ask questions if any. Yeah, we have a question there. Or I can repeat the question if you just shout it loud enough for me to hear. Identifying this is the quality attribute, and how did you quantify it into your data set? So, when you say quality attribute, just help me understand what quality attribute. Uh, one in example terms of satisfaction, uh, employee satisfaction with respect to job as well as salary, all those things. So, quality oh, yeah, attributes, yeah. yeah. So yeah. We, we don't know. I mean, we don't know the employee satisfaction, we don't know the employee emotion, their personal happiness aspects. We would love to, but we don't have that data. So, we simply, uh, you know, we simply use what we can use. For example, we use the person's salary. We use person's team salary for that job, company salary for that job, industry salary for that job, just to have multiple indicators to show if there's a pull from market, possible pull from market or not. So that's how we proxy some of this information because truly speaking, we can't, we don't have measures of human emotion there. But that's a good point. Um, we also proxy, like I said, uh, effectiveness of manager, I don't have a way to find out in my database. So all I look is, has the manager been losing people? And use that as an input because past is known to me. And can I use it to leverage my uh, prediction? Absolutely. So these are proxying information wherever you can't use the right one. Thanks, thanks, thanks for a thanks. good question. Amit. Hi, my name is Ashish. So I have a question. Uh, so uh, when you are, are you considering seasonality as a factor? 
Oh yeah, yeah, seasonality indeed is a factor and which is why we actually, what we do is factor in, uh, see, uh, what we do is, uh, when we are talking about lagging factors, uh, which is autocorrelation, autocorrelation or time series model inherently has seasonality as one of the decomposed uh, aspects, right? Seasonality is one, randomness is another, and obviously, um, and I missed the third one, but uh, the autocorrelation is a third one. So all the three factors are included. We do have to because sometimes it's just that the season is high for no, uh, people to leave, right? Yeah. I agree. Mostly after performance reviews, by the way. Amit. Yes, uh, please. This is Kaushik. So ADP uh, is predominantly an American multinational? Yeah, yeah. It has a global presence, but it's yes. predominantly US. You are right. Yes. And uh, it has, you know, development centers in Hyderabad, Pune and all. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So you have different parameters and federal laws for US uh, employees. Very good question. Yeah, but yeah. you also now have a lot of Indian employees working for Indian companies also to process their payroll. Oh, yes. So you have different set of parameters and rule. So it's not a technical question. It's more of a business question. Yeah. So do you see uh, age discrimination, racial things, pin code, zip code, these are probably not applicable in India as of today. As of today yeah. So do you leverage those parameters when you do data, you know, mining for Indian uh, clients and their employees? Or you set, uh, follow federal laws for uh, US employees? How do you do that actually? So we have not taken it global. So we are still working with US and Canada clients as of now and uh, UK clients. So for UK clients, we have strict requirements around GDPR and their, uh, you know, Blue Harbor law, Safe Harbor laws. But uh, we have not yet really uh, started doing, so we go by the least common, uh, you know, possible. Uh, so we restrict ourselves with anything that applies to any single place across the board. But we want to do that. And we want to really be able to create a separate model where it is allowed to use an attribute. And that is what any of us will do. We will probably create a, right now I'm creating for the 27 industries a model each because industry patterns vary. Uh, some software engineering manufacturing is more likely or less likely to leave. But for laws of the land and to deal with them, we will most likely build a model for each nation. That will bring more accuracy, I guess. More accuracy, yeah, absolutely. Because the features may actually go up and down. And that's where you start looking at, should I go for a separate model, even at the cost of making it a little more specific? Because every new model, you have to maintain it too. But that's the nature of the beast. Uh, you have to get accurate too. All right, so um, Rajiv tells me it's over for me. Uh, I'm happy to connect with any of you and all of you o offline, yeah? So, hello. Yeah, 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 sure. No, no problem. I, I'll take it offline with you and I assure you, uh, I'm a talker, man. <laughs> I'd like to request uh, Mr. Atul Agarwal, Chair NASCOM ERC and Director App Software to please come up here and uh, felicitate Mr. Amit Sharma, Chief Data Scientist ADP. Thank you so much. Thank you.